Adam, you're you're theming up too. It looks like flow, flow, flow. <laughs> like I really wanted to just break flow, in flow, with, flow. <laughs> yeah, some um, some cheesy power platform based uh, Santa noise, and that's that's about as good as I got. Flow, flow, flow. That's okay. There we go. <laughs> I couldn't have come up with that. Marcus, could you have done better? I I don't know. I could not. <laughs> Well, guys, welcome to another Stone Ridge Confab, the last one of the year. We wanted to be a bit festive today, and you can see that uh, we've done a little bit of updates to our broadcast. Uh, it looks like our poor little Santa is stuck in the chimney right now forever during this stream. So we'll have to see how that works with chat, because, guys, I did not test that before to see what happens with chat. So welcome everyone. Uh, today, I think uh, topic-wise, we were looking at covering really 2020 in review, right guys? We've got some fun topics to go through and just kind of chat with you guys on because I think the stream right after this, we're looking at, um, you know, next steps, right? So 2021, what are going to be some of the emerging technologies? Uh, but today is more about just kind of looking back on a year's worth of confab that we've done guys i heard that yep. a guy in a santa hat just wanted to phone it in this week <laughs> um no i'm joking no like it was <laughs> end of end of the year and you know we've we've been doing this for uh, for about i think a year now um you know getting together with everybody in the community and having you know, pointed conversations, very deep conversation, you know, uh, deep dive, low level stuff. But every now and then we do keep it a little higher level and just get that five, 10,000 foot view. And that's really what this is for is, is, hey, what what territory did we go through and what did we cover this year? What stuck out and, and what what gets us up in the morning? What are we looking forward to, too? So it's it's going to be a fun one. Yeah, Bill, even in chat, you know. First off, Bill, thank you again for your help with the classes that we were looking at. I appreciate it. And secondarily, Windows 3.1 Paint. Actually, that's Windows 95 because in the top right, you can see it's got the new X, Maximize, and Minimize that are in there. So it's a cool background that I saw him put on. I'm like, yeah, they've had, they had some <laughs> shirts for sale as well, right? Yeah. Yep, they had sweaters and and they they branded like the LinkedIn logos, you know, with the kind of the the uh, bit breakdown. It's it's fun. That's awesome. Yep, yeah, definitely a classic, Sabrina. So guys in chat as well, Rad, good to see you. Uh, Forest Runner, great to see you as well. Glad you guys are able to join today. Like I said, we're gonna have some fun with this. Um, one of the things that we do want you guys in chat to think about: I'm um, 2020. What technologies? personally um, impacted you um, as you were working or looking at technology. And we're trying to stay a little bit more focused on the business systems perspective, obviously. That is so awesome. That cup just vanished into whiteness right there when you did that. That was kind of different. So <laughs> I was looking at the camera and I'm like, whoa, Adam's, yeah, look at that. Like when you do that, it like disappears. And then it looks like you're drinking. It's a green screen mode. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. But what were those technologies that you found out in 2020? Because we've there's been a lot. I mean, and there's been a lot of shift too. Like what we thought at the beginning of 2020 versus what happened, obviously with COVID and all all of that focus, uh, really changed some of the product paths that we've seen as well, right, guys? I mean, Teams is a perfect example that we were talking about even before stream right yep yeah yeah i think you you see the probably the the development plan for teams completely uh get shifted around the last nine months i i can't imagine microsoft thought teams would be where it is today uh a year ago um, and I, I think it's uh, amazing how they've they've updated the product to really meet the the needs of the users um and and i'll say what you want about teams i think it works pretty well today um i was not a huge fan of teams when it first came out um, yeah i i just was not interested in it and um but i think today i'm i'm a user i'm a believer in it and i think it um it does help and it's much more stable than it was uh, it was in terms pain of call quality yeah everything. it was painful to move from skype for business to teams yes. I, I will say yeah. that when we did that wasn't that 20 2018 guys that we went through it's that early really yeah, Sabrina, you're right. It's a long way. Yep. And when when we went through that, like, yeah, I, I had I to have just, like, yeah, I, I did I too. Like I was I was like, I know, I know, Skype for business. It's straightforward. And let's be real. Everybody was like, 
and I can pop the windows out and move them around. And <laughs> right. that was literally like the one thing, yeah. ever, the hook that everybody was hung on, which is like that. That's but that you know it's those little usability factors that that make the biggest impact. And I was in the same boat, and I literally uh, could not live without Teams. Yeah. We had the, I mean, you would, the UI designer, I mean, I, I will give feedback to Microsoft with this. Think about how people use your product first. Don't think about, you know, what's bare minimum. Think about how we use it because it, it almost, it actually almost poisoned it to an extent as well, right? So, because that perception then of it, it was just an uphill battle. And when you go to a user base and you say, guys, it's coming, it's coming, you know, and it takes so long to get to it. It's just painful to, to do that. I feel for, for users that, you know, don't entirely understand the development life cycle of some of these products as well. So, yep. but even with that, the shift then to the integration strategy with teams, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, th- absolutely. Yeah. The, the business apps integrating your productivity apps, integrating into teams. Um, it, you know, there's still some things that they need to do with the product, but it's uh, it's come a long way. Yeah, Sabrina, the pop out chats was the that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, it finally added that, and that was actually within the last couple of releases too. I mean, that was right. wasn't it spring release or something like that that they did that of 2020. So it's like, eh, well, glad that they had it. Even yeah, the updates I, this week, I don't know if you've gotten those. So when you start the call, you get the, the video preview and you can adjust your audio settings and stuff before you actually join a call. And it shows up in the, the front page yeah. for it, right, as you're joining it. I did like that addition. Like there are some usability yeah. enhancements now as they're getting more information on how people use it. That is yeah. really starting to make it easier to use, obviously. So, yeah. yeah but WebEx did that, you know, five, six years ago. I mean, that's where they've, they've just had to make uh, leaps and bounds in terms of development with teams to catch yeah. up. But I, but I think they're there now. Yeah, every demo yeah, we do teams. This, I, I think, Scott, am I able to share my screen? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I can I, over. I, th- I think I actually have um, footage of, like, when we, you said, we like, and we were, we were early adopters, and there were so many unknowns and, to be frank, limitations with teams at the time. So I, I actually just sat down and recorded, um, recorded something. This is actual footage of me. Um, <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> when, okay, now I've when, got it. <laughs> when we when we fully adopted team, or when we said we're cutting the cord, we're moving over. Um, yeah, I just had to record something just to keep it keep it in time. So this photo of it flaming. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is entirely a joke. Um, <laughs> but I thought it was going to be a dumpster fire. It ended up being I, 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 it, essential, an everyday essential. <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. I love it. And it, it did feel like that. So I guess let, let's let's back up and let's, let's go through 2020 kind of in progression here, like in terms of, you know, what we initially thought in 2020 and really how that evolved to an extent too, right? Because... You know, I think at the beginning of 2020, one of the big conversations that we were starting to have with customers, and we are in 2019 starting to talk about this internally, was the common data service concept. And we were putting a lot of focus into that concept because, you know, from our perspective, it makes, it still makes a lot of sense. Um, There's some changes too that we should talk about pricing for storage, for example, like there's, and then new teams environments create CDS, like, or Dataflex now, right? We should talk a little bit about that, right? Uh, Dataverse as well, right? So let's talk about that. First off, we were right on CDS. There, you can tell that it is the platform of unification that Microsoft is really trying to push. And all of our products, are building integrations on the dynamic side with it. So field service is there, sales, marketing for integration with it, right? You've got BC with the integration now that they've released as well. You've got dual right with finance and supply chain. You've got project ops that's using dual right capabilities as opposed to the data integrator in some scenarios. Like there's there's a lot of traction that's occurred now off of this. The difference, I think, has been it almost feels like it's almost too much that they've done with it. And, you know, let's talk about that because storage is a big pain point for some customers now. Storage and, and, you know, API 
throttling, you know, like best practice in flow design in terms of, okay, how many cards do you have in there? Being very mindful of, of governing API hits when you, you know, it can even be just a, a pretty straightforward flow. But if you, you know, at scale, if you have five, eight, 10,000 users in a system for those global enterprise organizations, you know, like they're, you need to develop cap uh, competencies and and uh, architectural best practice, like centers of excellence. I mean, it's it's a rabbit hole, um, not just, you know, storage, but also performance and how do we govern this stuff? Yeah, would you, so Herb was asking, could you recap all the name changes that took place in 2020? Absolutely oh, not. <laughs> no, we would need from right now until the, the end, end of, of the stream. <laughs> That and licensing changes. I'm not. It's Herb the best question, question of the day. It that. is. This is a festive hat. This is a festive hat. And Herb, you're not helping us here. You're not helping us. Topic. <laughs> you could get Leah to do one of those uh, word collage things that she puts together with all the name <laughs> changes. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's actually a great idea. At the center of it, like for me anyway, and I'm, you know, for others, like at the center of it, it still would be, it, it would be like, yeah, it's still CRM. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, you still have to translate it during your demos. You call it whatever, and people are looking at you, and you go, well, it's it's CRM. It used to be this. Oh, it I used to be it. this. It used to be this. And you keep on going down that path, right? Well, I guess the, the big thing then with CDS, though, is that, number one, it's called, what's it called now? It's not Dataverse. It's Dataflex, isn't it? Data, it's Dataverse. Dataverse. Okay. Dataverse, 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 Dataverse. Steve and I get mixed up on it. That's the one that I, they got kit canned, right? Because yep, the lawsuit that was, that was involved with it. Through, hey, we can't do that anymore. They tabled it, and so they reverted back to their their code name, you know, their development name, um, uh, Project Oakdale. Or, yeah, Project Oakdale. Yeah, it, well, that was the that was the bottleneck. That you know, it, it wasn't like DataVerse as a banner, as a label, as a thing, as a concept. Um, you know. Project Oakdale is, is team specific teams as a platform and whatnot, but like they they had to figure out the naming stuff before they could do the rest, so they landed on Dataverse, which is CDS, which is yeah yeah All right. So, but the the advantages though, so CDS was the right thing to recommend in 2020. Um, yep. It still is moving forward here as well. The conditions now that we need to start thinking about though, and you know, Rad stated it in the chat as well, storage you pay for storage like this very quickly became not out of control but kind of out of control meaning before the storage space requirements before 2020 they were pretty cheap per gigabyte weren't they weren't they like a buck 50 or something like that per gigabyte or something like that and then all well, of a sudden now it's, central it was nothing it was free for business central right yeah, absolutely yeah. and now yeah, business yeah but business central isn't on cds completely but at the same point now on common data service on finance and supply chain on um uh, bc they're now charging for storage space right, right? yep yeah so yeah and this is where i mean this is where um being being mindful of of what you're building what it's going to consume what are the data ramifications of the solutions that you're jumping into and what you know if if requirements are dictating that we go a certain path just be mindful of those outputs and what sort of impact that'll have on your technical landscape um but but i will say that it might not be ultra common knowledge or you know like people on internal it teams people who are really steering the ship you know, there are ways to offset, offload data oh, lakes, yeah. you know, automatic exports. And that's, and, and that's, I think that speaks to the learning curve, the quick pace of product development, the options, the solutions, the tight integrations that we have now, it's just not out there. So, you know, like when I'm, whenever I'm speaking with, with teams, um, very, I mean, very rarely will like a lake export come up. Like, mm -hmm. oh, can we can we can we archive this way, or can we can we actually offload to, to Azure to not uh, not uh, inflate our CDS storage? Yep. Uh, so you know, I think <laughs> I think the days of just bumping up your C your your DataVerse um, native storage, you know, based on those tiers and thresholds that you can bump it up with, I think more and more we are going to have to look at more of a big data model and some of the tools that historically have been considered um 
really enterprise that are much more accessible today and probably a lot more necessary for SMB organizations. Absolutely. I mean, hugely. I mean, so Forrest, to your point, so you do get like certain amounts of space for free, right? Or part of the license. Nothing is truly free, right? We all know that. Um, yeah, with but Business yeah, Central as well. Exactly. Same thing, right? They give yep, you yep. a certain amount of gigabytes, I think, for the database size. Many Correct. of those are pooled across like production and sandbox environments. So your requirement for production and also for sandbox counts against that sp storage space because it's by tenant, basically. So, right. you know, that's another big consideration that you have to go through when you're sizing with this now uh, to be able to understand that. But to Herb's point, I mean... I, I think the there's an argument for a lot of people that are on prem to say let's stay on prem because of a cost perspective, but architecturally that it's not very valid when you start looking at how the design patterns are occurring. And this is this is where the confusion is starting to set in when it comes to data lakes, when it comes to uh, data bricks and all these other ancillary technologies. I had a conversation with uh, Dave Stallman, he's a or VP of Sales and Marketing, um, and he's just like you know, these concepts, they're all new concepts. I, we need to understand why these exist in a lot of ways. And he's absolutely right, because the reason that they exist isn't because they're a better technology than an on-prem uh, capability where we used to have OLAP and OLTP. It's because now these services expose data and storage of data at different rates and at different requirement capabilities. So data lakes are way slower than your your data warehouse that you may have on Azure SQL, right? Because you can still do data warehousing in the cloud, but if you're not accessing that data all the time, but you need it every now and then for some type of analysis that you're doing, you don't want to pay for that premium of storage, or like you're saying, because of that cost. So that's why data lakes exist. I mean, that's that's the only reason why it exists is to be able to pump data from a storage area that's really, really cheap that you can access in your reporting. Whereas before on-prem, you'd buy hard drives and put them on 5,400 or 7,200 SAS drives, right, inside of your SAN right. to be able to do that. It's just... It's a slightly different mentality behind it. So I think that for 2021, I think that's going to be a bigger focus now that they're making that that forcing or the forcing of data requirements for storage on CDS, BC, you know, partners and customers. We're going to have to start thinking about when we design something, it can't be that the data lives there forever in that one table that you designed. You've got to start thinking about how do I clean this data up? after it's been there for a year or two years yep. maybe at max with it so it's part Data of your governance that, exactly and i think that's a big thing well we'll talk i think 2021 that'll be a topic for you know february saying this is something that you guys should start focusing on from a technology perspective with it so and microsoft does have if you look at app source they do have um there's one solution that i just saw this morning that was more in line with uh, automating um archival you know and that that is something that we didn't have to uh, focus on so much in years past when you know we had on-prem deployments and we had we were the masters of that domain. I would say the benefits of moving online far outweigh the cost. The costs, um, however, there are some very you know particular corners in this whole equation that um, you know there, there 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 could be at face value anyway a case to be made for staying on prem. But Microsoft's uh, to address that directly, Herb. I mean, Microsoft's going to stop supporting it. Like that that's just on the wall. They're going to stop. They already have in some you know in some ways in a lot of ways. Uh, it just won't be available. You know, you can't buy licensing for on-prem. If you're there, you can stay there, but there will be an end of life to what Microsoft wants to even dip their toes into uh, yeah. to help out. So all of that, all of that um, sort of, uh, you know, team knowledge and and and, and supporting on, on premises deployments, I'm speaking CRM, a D365 sales, customer service, et cetera. But, um, you know, that, that knowledge will be offload i mean partners will partners and customers will have to own everything including break fix and support um uh, and that's a that's a that's a tricky place to be in i mean the clock is ticking absolutely and then the other aspect of it obviously with cds is that you know it really exploded i mean teams now every every environment that you generate in teams creates a cds environment technically on the back end with it you know, that in yeah. 2020 was a pretty rapid departure. And 
it's not bad. Like, I don't think it's bad. It's almost like having separate access databases in a lot of ways. But going to your point, Adam, that's data governance, right? That's going to be a huge topic that people are going to have to start focusing on in, in 2021. 2021. 20, 2020. 2020. Um, the, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 at the heart of the conversation usually it, i mean i dance around it sometimes you know people that are that we're talking with dance around it sometimes it the the issue is where is it cheapest to store this freaking stuff <laughs> like where what it what is going to be the cheapest here yeah. and you know that is a very that's a it's a multifaceted question with many answers and and, it, and we as partners now you know that that is um if not a variable some coefficient along the way uh that we have to be much more on top of early early like when we're demoing when we're actually having product conversations um we've heard twice um in the past i've heard twice in the past we'll say three four weeks um the uh you know the uh, just some of these questions around data you know and it's it's in focus Absolutely. Yeah. And think another thing to think of with it is that, you know, we the advantages of going to cloud with the data. So before you probably couldn't store as much data as you theoretically can for the same cost. If you're using the right technologies, if you're using data lakes to store that data, the cheap per gigabyte, the, the cost per gigabyte. I mean, it's super cheap. I mean, it really is. And we're talking about, you know, in the future here, a consumption based model where you can store a massive amount of data, much more data than you've had in the past, and then report off of it with these technologies. So I think, like like you said, Adam, there, there's definite advantages to cloud that you'll never get on prem unless you have the ability to to scale out, you know, in your business a cost center for a full ISP model where you can buy that infrastructure and maintain it. If you're willing, yeah, if you yeah. if you want to do that, you better but, have a very tight financial plan well, of attack in place. Yeah, or 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 you can use like the technologies, the Azure Edge. You know, there's things that are out there that they introduced. That was another thing that they introduced right in 2020, where yeah. you can now have your data center managed through the Azure Hub, where you can provision and move Azure virtual machines, for example, between um, your Windows hosts or your infrastructure locally. And I thought that was a really cool concept because there is a market for very, very large companies that need, um, th it's cheaper for them to maintain their hardware still because of their unique requirements that they have. So, yep. and and just to kind of point, uh, Mr. Stallman, good to see that you're on, um, really beginning to think of ERP or business systems as transaction engines is absolutely correct. That it does the consumption of data. It doesn't matter where that data is. It's just consuming it to give you that result that you're going to need. And that's really that app service model. They want to abstract as much of that as possible. Of course, I'm yep. getting a call right now. So bring them on. Exactly. Welcome to Confab. <laughs> Who's who the is. caller? We, guys, we have a guest, ho a guest, guest host speaker. Today. Yeah. 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 It's probably the uh, IRS calling me from the. I've gotten those calls recently where. It's, you, you, no, it's, it, they jump on and they'll be like, would you like to extend your vehicle's warranty? And. Yeah. 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 Uh, no. Yeah. Get exactly. Exactly. So that's a good one. Oh, yeah. I mean, Herb, Herb just called it out. Your auto insurance. Yeah, our insurance has changed. Yeah. All the yeah, scam yeah, calls yeah, that you get yeah, about they, extending they, your warranty. They've got our block is what they keep on calling with it. Marcus, what what did you see on the business central side that you thought for, for 2020 was a pretty big impact? Um, I thought as you look at the integration with the power platform, I thought there was some significant advancements. So talking about Power BI for a long time, but, but actually seeing... Uh, for example, the updated connector to uh, Power BI so that you get, you just have better reporting. Um, you know, before we'd, we'd use the API connector and then you'd have to supplement with the OData. Um, but we're really able to do it with the with the API connector now into uh, Power BI, which I, I think is awesome. Um, you know, you get the Power BI report on the desktop. You can integrate it other places within the application. If you're familiar with fact boxes, the filtering works. Um, so I think cleaning up that, that component was really nice. Again, a year ago you had it, but it was just missing some components. Oh, um, Adam's got his hand up. You're 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 muted, or you can't. I can't hear you. I I muted because I was laughing so hard at Herb, who has he's got the zingers today. Yeah. Now he's, he's 
throwing out all the scam call types, and I just <laughs> lost it. Um, I, I can raise my hand on this one, Marcus. I get to have a BC conversation with you a little bit. It's well, I saw, easy yeah, you enough. Were, it's you were easy enough yesterday during a yeah. demo. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I, I, it's easy enough that uh, you know. Um, and just and this isn't a BC specific, you know. This is across the board. Just making it easier to yeah, integrate, it is, making right. it easier to shake hands somewhere else in the Microsoft ecosystem and and beyond. But it's easy enough for me uh, or, or for people to where I jumped into uh, a BC org and I had a Power BI with an embedded Power app that was in there and got it enabled in that in that uh, in that fun you know the the reports and if you have that published out to your workspace or somewhere else in power bi it's just it's so much easier to do that stuff yeah yep. Yep. yeah 2020 um, that that was huge yep go ahead sir yeah Marcus. coupled with that i'd say power automate you know scott and I, you and i have gone through some bc things of of creating alerts alerts based on change log changes um you know the workflows integrate so nicely into into power automate i again i just think that was a huge advancement forward um you know we've talked about it for a long time but it it, it finally now i think works um and, and it worked before but it was just harder to do it than it than it is today um even bringing transactions back into business central so you know we worked up some proof of concepts for some people um and it i think it's it's really fascinating what what we can do and how you rethink I mean, as much as you rethink data storage with an ERP system, I think, I think thinking about what an ERP system does and what it can do uh, in terms of integrations with other applications, it's breaking a lot of molds. Oh, uh, it's not huge. an isolated thing that sits in your environment. It's very much integrated with other uh, technologies, other platforms, which was harder to do before. Um, and, and now I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's Sabrina. There's another name change flow to Power Automate. Is that 2020 that that occurred? That was 2020, wasn't it? I don't know. Very beginning, been. maybe 2019, the 2020. The documentation still says flow, so I, I don't it? know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. What else did we cover then? So we covered a lot of that. So the Power Automate, like you said, Marcus, I mean, that that was a, a key focus that we had at the very beginning of the year, and that's just exploded. Like every demonstration that I go into now and a lot of our customers, so this goes beyond demos. There's lots of customers that are using flows. They don't even have to talk to us about it. They just create them. One of them yep. that we created though too, internally, Marcus, if I remember on BC, like BC doesn't have the ability beyond the uh, custom uh, APIs to make it so that if an event occurs inside of BC, like if somebody updates a field change, you want to fire off a flow. Um, Correct. We were able to create a technology basically or code and extension that does that. And yep. it seems to help many scenarios, right? In terms of... Oh, absolutely. To, to create true alerts. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's what people ask for. And that's what this does now. Yeah. Uh, leveraging Power Automate to do it. And we've had deals where customers have came back to our team and said, hey, we see that this flow capability is available to integrate with. Should we use that? And our team is like, oh, yeah, that was a new feature that they just added type of a thing. So there's there's definitely a lot of adoption, I would say, in terms of the power automate capabilities. And that was that was fun to see to force to cover it and just to kind of see what was going to happen. And then now to see that traction behind it. Now, it's great from a de from an end user perspective. I think from a dev tool, the one thing that we probably should have covered a little bit more, maybe we do this in 2021, really is the difference between flow and uh, automate or the flows in automate and logic apps, right? Because logic apps is really where you start getting into like the solution architects. Like I know Ray on our team, he's used those quite a bit for the integrations that we've done at customer sites because they're more enterprise specific. That would yep. probably be a fun topic that we should discuss because that's more of the enterprise and that ties into some of the other technologies that Microsoft has made then too. They use logic apps to do those integrations. Yeah, cloud flows. Now I always, and yeah. uh, they're, now, they're now parsed into cloud, fl cloud flows and like the, is it, are they just sticking with UI flows? I don't know, to be honest. Yeah, and there's a whole desktop. I'm downloading the Power Automate desktop app right now. Um, like there's a new, I haven't really jumped into that yet. So I always ask during my demos, what what of the Power Platform uh, companies are using? And I would say a year ago, 
I would get one or two that are maybe uh, have toyed with Power BI, but they haven't really implemented anything, and nobody was doing anything with Power Automate. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna guess probably more than half uh, are in process of or have deployed Power BI reporting at some level within the organization, and you're probably at that quarter point of Power Apps where they've already investigated and deployed Power Apps in their environment, aside from the ERP solution that we're looking at or the or the solution that we're looking at um, from a dynamics perspective. So yeah. I, I would say that's a change. We're not necessarily bringing that technology as part of the ERP system. Clients have already used it. They understand the value in it and, and they love the ability to uh, further leverage that with, a, with an ERP deployment. Yeah. And people are researching ahead too. I mean, so, you know, yes. one of the, the key things that we did with the Ignite, so Ignite is where this really took off is, you know, we've used it before in, uh, I think at the beginning of year, our technical strategy that we talked through with, with a lot of our customers and a lot of our, our prospects, even that became customers because of our strategy, um, the democratization, right? I mean, that word, when it first came out, I was like, eh, come on, you know, what's that really mean, so to speak? And, you know, I would say, partially because of what happened with COVID. I mean, I think that that accelerated that mentality because of the remote work requirements that were needed um, to be able to gather information and interact with it. Um, examples even that we've used, I mean, we've used what uh, it's called customer voice now is forms pro to do a survey in you know for our customer base on some of the initiatives that they wanted to tackle and feedback that we wanted um, and it was a very awesome tool one of our team members sky was able to go through and set up that that form that was going to be submitted we submitted it got that data back and it was just a, a very easy uh, interaction that uses a lot of those power uh, platform tools to, to bring that data back for us to be able to take action off of it, to create opportunities, follow up on leads that are with it, and really identify that data. So like I said, I think COVID in some ways has accelerated a lot of those technologies that need us to be able to work from our phones remotely, um, and they've just polished yeah. them off a lot more. Well, yeah. Diversity drives innovation. Um, nobody wanted it. Nobody wants it. It's we're not. Yeah. Change, right? Um, Change is tough. But, but yeah, but it did. You know, it it drove it drove the product development for teams. We allowed teams right now, but it had it was a it was necessary. Um, you know, for Microsoft to not just stay competitive with the product they intended to compete against Slack and whatnot, but I mean, they they. <laughs> Put it this way, um, COVID changed the landscape and the impetus to develop these applications and solutions so much that Salesforce bought Slack. Yeah, absolutely. Like the Teams, Teams was <laughs> such a big impact with it in yeah. 2020 in terms of think about a user experience where a user logs into Teams and then accesses the customer account by clicking on that customer, which is your team, and you have access to their opportunity information. You have access to the projects that they're interacting with. You have access to, you know, any custom apps that you develop all within one user interface. Hey, Cryptic Beige, thanks for the follow. Appreciate it. So, I mean, it, it, it was huge in terms of teams and the focus of the integrations and maybe that in 2020 that's something i you know we wanted teams i think we concepted it earlier in march and april if i remember correctly where we did even um an embedding of how we can use teams with power apps and all these different uh, technologies that were there but i think they've gone way further than we expected in 2020 for that to be honest we were, well we were, we were filling gaps yeah. and trying to innovate you know a little ip leaning into graph doing some fun things that you were working on scott but <laughs> then like Oakdale came around yeah. and, and, uh, you know, the, uh, we just talked about it. The, is it fluent or fluid? Fluid. I think um, it is. Isn't it UI. fluid UI? Um, but you know, actually it might be fluent too. I'll look it up while we're so talking. Many, like so many new features. And, and the thing that I really like is, um, if I'm being blunt, Microsoft loves their bells and whistles in different corners. Fluent. You were right. It is fluent. Yep. Um, so, you know, like having feature, having a feature just for the feature's sake, that has been a thorn, I would say, in in apps in the past. You know, sitemap redesign, anybody that's dealt with CRM version 2013, don't get me started. But um, 
you know, now to your point earlier, Scott, they are, it seems anyway, it seems that they are focusing much more on what are people doing? Let's enable that. Like, let's actually focus on meaningful user experience. I like to say, you know, we, we say things like scalability or, you know, if we have projects that are phased, phase one, phase two, phase three, build with purpose, like understand where, where you're building, not just that you can build some things. Exactly. So it's yep. very encouraging. Yeah. And I, I think that, that that's a positive thing compared to having technology lead, right? And that's, I think in 2020, one thing that we focused on internally as an organization was... Let's not have it where we're leading with technology. Let's have technology support what the business process is. And that was a really core change um, in the industry, to be honest, where we're, we're saying um, let's, let's, let's use the right tools. And that goes into, I think, another thing that we talked about in 2020, moving to an app service model, right? So we have always thought about and this has been a transition for our team even internally at stone ridge we have always thought of ourselves as crm people or erp people or field service people or bc people and you know it used to be back in the day um, one of the expressions we use with dynamics nav was that you know do you bleed blue because we had blue yeah. logos and you know there's that whole culture right and that's also why when they tried to instill this concept of project green way back in the day i'm kind of dating myself now uh, with mr darren laborn and i think our i think becky our, our president now of leverage she was on the dev team with that ironically i i don't know if anyone else in chat is was on that project green dev team if you are put something in chat i want to hear uh so but the point here is that we, there is so much uh i don't know friction between those groups because microsoft acquired gp they acquired nav they acquired ag zapta they you know built crm from the ground up basically and carl you were on it too. that's awesome it was oh i didn't know that okay yeah, okay but there's all those it out. yeah i didn't know that interesting yeah. well there was all those mentalities right that were so uh, conflicted and when they said project green was going to replace everything the entire channels channels plural gp nav everything they were all in uproar over it um and it was you know i remember darren showing me a uh, proof of concept with it with the aot like he showed in visual studio the aot that they had that we now use in dynamics 365 uh, finance and supply chain which is interesting I, I would say um i don't know if that's the exact technology but the concept is still there bring it to now now we are in a culture where i am no longer a finance and supply chain person when i demo i actually demonstrate every single technology that microsoft has on the business system side and we call it business system intentionally because there may be a requirement that comes up from an end user perspective that I need to use field service because it's it supports the business better. I don't want to force them to use capabilities inside of BC or finance or supply chain that don't support the business process and tell them to mold their business process to this when I know there's another solution that's out there that already supports that. So this app service model, I think 2021, it's gonna even be bigger. Like the strategy for the integration between these needs to be thought through, but security, yeah, security, security will be the banner for 2021. And this is sort of dipping into our first sessions in confab next yeah. year, but yeah. already thinking about it. Security is going, especially now with the solar wind stuff going on, um, the, uh, the Russian hack or, you know, whatever happened, um, on the, uh, you know, outright denials all over the place, but who, whatever agent, uh, you know, did, I mean, security is going to be the banner, um, you know, leading into next year, I believe. Yep. Agreed entirely. And I think that, you know, with that too, I mean, that gives us a, a lot of, you know, great capabilities, right? We'll be able to figure out, you know, kind of what, what, what is going to be the key aspects that you should be focusing obviously in 2021, but 2020, I mean, just kind of harnessing. Yeah look at that we it, it was right like we knew that this app service model was coming and it's become more common and it's a huge differentiator i think marcus one of the opportunities that we were working on we had a bc opportunity that needed very advanced warehouse capabilities and we actually talked about going and showing dynamics 365 supply chain management scm because the finance perspective was handled inside of business central 
but they needed more advanced warehouse capabilities such as uh, voice assisted picking they wanted yep. uh, better handheld scanner integration like really top end handheld scanner integration transportation management and we were like well supply chain management has that right so it's I, I just see well, more and more of that. We're talking e-commerce too. Same scenario. Oh, yeah. So Dynamics 365 Commerce, right? Exactly. Yep. yep. With BC. Yep. 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 So, I, like I said, that that was pretty cool to see as as really our, our future. You know what we thought and then what we saw come out of it. I guess, guys, just to be candid, like, what did we really miss on? Like, what was a a big miss that you can think of that we should have talked during Confab or during any of our technology meetings that... well, I don't know if I don't know if it was a miss but I think I think again being a little frank you know yeah. D dynamics 365 marketing we kind of talked about that before we jumped on today um, now this is you know this is particular it's not you know the conversation Scott was having around hey we, we're jumping into different territory this is you know the marketing module the marketing application for all the CE CRM stuff but um, God, the, the product maturity that I've seen um, in the past six months from from marketing is um, I, I wish I would have um, jumped into that a little sooner, a little bit more um, with some of the things they were doing. A lot of it is recent, right, from wave two uh, at the end of this year. Um, so it wasn't that we really missed. We were kind of waiting for certain T's to be crossed. And um, that as well as you know I, I think we maybe could have kept up a little bit more momentum with or some touch points pulse checks with customer insights yeah just because that is such an enigma for people when when i try to explain what is the value proposition for customer d365 customer insights as a customer data platform um you know unless there's a robust it team unless that really is you know Lot of different custom applications big data lots of data you know e-commerce triggers like so many so many different types of data and where it's coming from sources of truth like unless you're really in that enterprise setting you're not probably going to be super invested in a very robust customer data platform like customer insights however they just they made it so accessible where you know even if you are an smb organization big data that's for everybody we let off with that so like really truly understanding the one stop the true customer profile and having that really um you know be be fleshed out by multiple sources of data erp crm excel sheets who cares but really having that unification platform to really understand no matter which tendril or no matter which leg or or arm of the business or business unit or uh, function of your business having all of that feed into a single source and then being able to actually for you know i, I led with marketing for for a reason being able to feed that into um you know machine learning artificial intelligence using r script developing your own models and then building audiences and segments you know with full automation that is insane like that is it, it, just like bots, just like portals, just like a few other things, I never would have imagined that, you know, would be demonstrating machine learning feeding into automatic audience and segment building based on trend analysis from big data pools. You know, like that's, it's, it, it, that accessibility factor, I think, is, is what is so big for me, uh, making it easy enough. You have to learn, you have to learn uh, new thing, new concepts, but just making it easy enough to jump in is, is great. So the customer insights and marketing thing, I think, is where I wanted to go. Yeah. Yep, that makes sense. I'll, I'll say, Marcus, one maybe, not to be pointed, I've been a little bit, not disappointed, but, you know, I was expecting, I guess, more from BC on the integration with Power Platform in a lot of ways. Like, they, they've got some really good tools that are there, but at the same point, an example like Power Apps natively, just having a Power App that you could share inside of there. We have that across, I think, all of the technologies except BC. We can do yep. it. There's ways to do it, right? So don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say we can't do it. It's just that it's not as easy, for example, for an end user to tackle, right? Yep. Um, I think that's a or, big... Or usable. Yeah. 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 It's just clumsy at this point. Yeah. And I, I, like I said, we're kind of nitpicking here with, with what we... What we thought, like I would have expected more, more of that from the BC perspective with it. On the FNO yeah. side as well, I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of confusion, like that they, I thought that they would polish off more in 2020 with 
how you access the data layer for a flow, for example. Like how, how do you set up a flow to trigger something effectively inside of it? They had a period of time where they were deprecating connectors and then they reintroduced them. And that might have been part of the problem with it. But there was... You know, there were some challenges, I think, in that area that in 2020, I was not expecting really that that to occur in a lot of ways. So, yeah, and Carl had mentioned here as well, I think Project Blue was an attempt to convert AX from X++ to C Sharp, where you might have seen the AOT in Visual Studio. Project Green was an attempt to platform ERP on web technologies. Yeah, it, it, it might be, Carl. Um, I know that if, uh, if Darren was, maybe if, he, if Mr. Laybourne was uh, in charge of both of those projects or was the technical person behind them, um, I know that we were focused on green for that meeting because it was a partner discussion with all the uh, NAV partners back in the day, all the leaders of their different uh, uh, companies that I was in on. So it'd be interesting to, to see. Read his manifesto. Who has a manifesto? Who? who doesn't? Who, who is a manifesto? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the Stone Ridge Manifesto yeah. is that what we're going after? I think I, uh, to <laughs> the the. <laughs> oh, Rob. Red, uh, love it, love it. So, so one of the things on on this theme, you know, things that maybe were maybe we were hoping for that didn't come around. Um, you know, in in my world, it, it, like. We work with a lot of manufacturing organizations. We work with, um, you know, ag businesses and, and um, the, the sales enablement uh, that we have in D365 sales, very powerful. Like, wow, you get a lot right out of the gates, especially with the newer features like the more advanced forecasting and the premium with uh, sales insights. Yep. Right. So leaning a little bit more into the uh, the uh, intelligence pieces um, and trying to be more proactive. I just I really wish because there are a few partners. In fact, there are a couple of MVPs who started a business. I, oh, is that Sales Spark. I can't remember exactly what their name is, but um, they they're I believe their niche is um, more proactive sales enablement, you know? So like having some of, uh, some more robust inbuilt automation trends, activity management, things to really, you know, salespeople, that's, that's us, you know, jumping in, jumping into a system and, and you know what, what we do in projects is we design, we build, and we build a lot of that automation, you know, for businesses, because it is going to be particular to an organization, but really trying to lay a, a foundation for more of that, early funnel sales enablement that gets you the conversations quicker, gets you those conversations with, uh, you know, you're better informed. And, and yeah, we, we as a, as a partner tend to design and build that a lot because it is going to be specific to organizations. But I think Microsoft can focus more on that sales insights piece and trying to, to drive some value um, in that sales enablement pool, because we've sort of been locked into the same, pattern the same tool set with sales in the crm world anyway for a decade yeah. you know with some big innovations like business process flows and portable business logic business rules and and a few other things but um but, but really like fundamental value add in early sales processes and follow-ups and not losing data not losing conversations not losing touch points being on top of it especially with the amounts of data that we're talking about so yep. i think that was one one area i think they they you know it's fine but maybe that'll come. Yeah, and that might be something for for 2021, right? That we see maybe as a potential because maybe these these you know you know it's like the SWAT, right? This the the weaknesses I'd say to a degree, um, and I don't like that word. It's just it, there's no there's not as much investment around it because there's not as much demand around it. Is really the the typical uh response to that right and that there may be truths to that and i think that that's that's what we have to help guide our customers through and that's what we try to identify is what do we see as a pattern is there a strong isv already here if that isv is involved i mean does it do a really good job and does it make sense then for microsoft to take that on examples of that like credit card management i would never ever want right. microsoft to manage credit card management i mean Likewise. they've tried and it just does not work really well we want somebody fdms vital whoever it is they they know credit card processing right they're the processors for visa amex mastercard why, why would we have microsoft get involved with that when there's strong leaders in those spaces i'd rather have integrations to those more than anything so Agreed. yeah and dave you're right yeah project green 
It's a scary word now. I think that I brought up. I'm I'm giving people scared scared thoughts. Um, well, that's I that's it's counterbalancing my complete ineptitude on what we're even talking about. So that's yeah yeah. Uh, the uh, the one that I wanted to sh throw out there was uh, PVA Power Virtual Agents like that to bring it bring it away from things that maybe were missed or or things we were hoping for. Something that really was just. It was so fun to jump into and and easy to manage and really just like this framework to enable conversational UI. It, I, I am in love with Power Virtual Agents. And I know, Scott, you've been dipping into that recently, too. Um, and it's the, the ability to jump in as a process owner, as a subject matter expert on the business side and lend so much to the, the, the development and design. And that's really what the Power Platform is all about. But um, in a in a like through a lens that people often thought was a little off limits, you know, a little inaccessible. So that accessibility factor coming back up, and just the the ability to snap into Bot Framework, and you know, some of the design concepts that they took once you jump into Bot Framework, kind of like Logic Apps and Power Automate. Like, oh, this I know where this came from, and you know, there are similar concepts. But bots, conversational UI, conversation design, that was a new world for me and um and it was really fun to jump into and it still is very fun it's one of my bigger passions you know in the whole stack like in terms of tool sets so hey, that was I, a huge highlight yeah and i i 100 percent agree i mean that's one thing so pva we did cover it just to give us a little bit of credit with it probably about six months ago i'm looking at our playlist just really quickly here to, to go through those capabilities at a base level, right? And I, like you said, I used it in a, a demonstration for, um, uh, you know, setting up a collection, credit and collections bot. <laughs> it would actually go into FNO and, and identify balance information, like who is the top offender for receivables, allow you to link to it as well. So you could click on it, it would open up then uh, finance and operations. So, you know, bots, like I think, We'll talk more about this on 2021 because that's one of the topics yep. I do want to bring up. I think that is huge for automation, information access, like set it up and make it so that you have a bot that you can interact with it. And it's a user based tool. So it's not something that has to have a lot of tech dev around. I just think it's a, a great opportunity there for that as well. So yep. well, I had a really good experience with a bot this morning on the Dun & Bradstreet website. Really? I thought it did a great job of leading me down the right path to get assistance. That Yeah, I've gotten bot emails like after I've created an environment. So yeah, the bots, I think it's good and bad. Like I think the, the thing that we're going to want to bridge in the future here with that is going to be that personalization and that human touch that we add to bots because there's always been the concept of some type of if then this type of logic that you you could actually technically create a bot for example in a flow back in the day to yeah. you know you'd have to abstract a front end for it but you could actually have a flow that would interact with it somehow if you wanted to but yeah. yeah. Well, I think the other key is the implementation of those tools. Yeah. You know, having it's really cool, but to, to think through how is the thing going to work, uh, you know, I, I've just had horror stories of bots. They, they have not been helpful. They've been more frustrating than they've been good. Um, so implementing the tool is important. You, you know, want to name a company gotta, there, Marcus? At all? Okay. <laughs> I, I've got a couple that I, I could I could name, but um, uh, being on the phone with them is no better than the bot framework that they have. So. <laughs> exactly. Um, don't name them, because then we can we can go talk to them and say we can make your we can make <laughs> yes. your experience. Better. We, we can help I, your customers. Come on, dude. I actually emailed their customer service department and said, uh, "Hey, we actually use this technology, so if you need help, please call me because your implementation is really bad." Uh, yeah, we, we've seen some. They did some. say thank you. I would pass it on. But um, anyway, yeah, that, that's where we need a delivery team that knows how to implement the technology. Too. Yeah, Double edged sword being in technology and understanding yeah. customer yeah, service. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that, that is. <laughs> You're some... so angry. So you, you send an email and you go, look, I'm not trying to be a butt here. However, I do know what I'm talking about. Please listen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can't say that without coming off as like a conceited. Yeah, you, no, you know, you, 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 you've whatever. already lost at that point, right? Yes. Or, or on the other end, the person's like, "Oh, great, one of these people that knows another everything." One of, another, another one of those. Guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think another thing too, just to go back to kind of the topics that we covered that seemed to also gain some traction. So IoT. IoT was another huge yeah. one this year. Like in 2019, the concept started getting introduced, I think, in the connected field service, because that's when they started introducing that. This year? Before that, even. 
but yeah. it really wasn't we, we didn't have that accessibility a, factor again it seemed like there was just that's uh, a good point there we didn't have the inroads and now we've got multiple yeah because i remember in 2019 being at a conference where i finally went to go look at some of the iot details that they had created but even right. like ron rude one of our, our our sales guys i'm gonna call him a sales guy see if he's in chat here ron if you're in <laughs> chat but he uh he actually used to sell uh, IoT connected devices, and they used, ironically, Salesforce as the platform for that. Um, didn't turn out very well from what I've heard. But at the same point, now we have the IoT capabilities, and I have used that for um, a couple of different demonstrations where we're doing some type of asset management or data Save management. Yeah, exactly. For um, in the future here, one of the releases that's going to be coming out for uh, finance um, in the asset management capabilities, IoT integration. So your machines being able to send you information back into uh, Dynamics to automate the generation of work orders. That one, I think, you know, I think 2021, that'll be a conversation topic that we're going to bring up again. But that I think is going to be once again, just more anything that's data centric in my mind feels like it's the right path for businesses to look at because Absolutely. you can now create apps that take this data and do something with it. Right. It's just it's such an easy value prop. Like you said, Dave, yeah, no brainer. It's just I just don't see where that that couldn't go down the path that would be beneficial for any type of manufacturer, especially when you get down to these devices now <laughs> and I'll show like you guys are gonna laugh at this look at this that doesn't look dangerous at all does it not at all power strip with wires coming out of it those are low voltage wires guys you don't have to worry about it so but the point is oh, so that... you're gonna get zapped but it won't kill you no you won't get <laughs> direct current low voltage direct current come on speech a little bit yeah 12 volts 12 volts okay but the point i wanted to show with that was that you can add these little devices for a buck. I, I think I've talked to you guys about this probably more times than not. And then you can start collecting data. It's like, guys, where are you at with this? From a manufacturer perspective, your machines yeah. can collect information and send it to you as long as the customer has Wi-Fi enablement at a minimum for a dollar, for a dollar for the devices to add to your machines. It's just, yeah. It's that awesome. that's one that's that I, th I thought was pretty cool. Don't worry, one, we won't call your home one, insurance company. Thanks, Sabrina. I appreciate yeah, it. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> one more thing that I did want to shout out uh, before we kind of wrap up today is, um, yeah, I talked about uh, CI and marketing um, and a few other things here and there, but <sighs> gotta gotta say it, PCF, uh, Power Apps Component Framework, the ability to innovate like for so 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 long on crm projects dynamic crm 365 you can't hit the dom you can't hit the dom if you want it to look a certain way have a certain experience you are up a creek i think they say yep. um yep so you know we off limits it was entirely off limits well now we have a whole new development layer to build and design and control our own experiences native to the application scalable to multiple applications portable if you want to sell the stuff or you know if you want to uh, package it up for the community there's a whole community for pcf you know for the, for the controls out there and it's just amazing to see what people are doing that will be a huge one for 2021 as well like pcf layers across applications innovating user experiences uh i mean this is a this is a space where it Microsoft is going to see what some people are doing and go, yoink, we're going to actually incorporate that into that IP is now ours. Uh, you made this. I made this. That is and... what we missed. We missed that one. I quite, I mean, th there were rumblings, I think, of it. Just to your point, Adam, I used that in one of our last demonstrations. I needed to create a custom control in Power Apps. I think I talked about an iframe, and I think I even showed it on here. You don't have the ability in a Canvas app to have an iframe. And I needed that so I could actually embed bots before I think now they actually have the bot embedding that they added. But I needed a, a, a way to basically show, for example, a map or yeah. to show a, a, a custom web page or whatever it is. And I had to use, like you said, the PCF capabilities. It was super easy to do. Um, it wasn't very complex. Coded up my own iframe control for it. Used some of the sample libraries to get me going. But within two, three hours, I had a component that I could upload into my environment and then put that component inside of Power Apps. And yeah. like you said, 
it's it's game changing in the aspect of bridging that gap between the end user and then the pro dev because yep. now the pro dev can think about hey i can create a control that i can give to end users that they can use to create solutions off of and that and you built you built a window right yeah. you you built yep. a window to a bot Yep. I mean, I've, I've, we, I've seen some controls out there that, you know, are taking multiple sources of data, like within the system or I guess elsewhere, too. But just this this whole new world of being able to define, drive, develop, design, implement a user experience within like model driven apps, like your own playground, your own way to work with, see, report on data. It's uh, that is something we've never had. That is one of the most innovative, I would say, uh, corners of the whole, like the three stack ecosystem is, uh, is the ability to, you know, especially when you look at like adaptive card integrations or, um, or the fluent UI, like it's just, we have that, we have that, I think a big theme, this whole thing, this whole session has been accessibility. These doors are opening to us because Microsoft is doing the legwork to open them for us. Yep. The, un the underlying, the fundamental, um, you know, architecture of these tool sets. Uh, so kudos on that. Yeah, and I thinking about it now, you got me thinking. I wonder if Telerik um, has made any Power App components yet, because I mean, we start th thinking about. Yeah, I threw that out there. Kendo, we, uh, actually, right? Yeah, Kendo UI. That yeah. was the whole suite that uh, uh, Michael on our team here and, and I worked with, and another uh, one of our customers, developers. That's kind of what we used um, before PCF took off. Um, you know, just with some unknowns and whatnot. So. It's same concept, right? You've got a, you've got libraries, you've got controls, you've got plug and play items, you've got API access. Like it's, but now that's in the system. Now that's a whole development layer that we have, and we can, can we can control and build against natively, which is super exciting. Oh, I'm I'm super excited about that. Like I'll actually in chat here, I just put a kind of a a, a public preview uh, statement. They call it the Power Apps Component Framework, right? Uh, PCF and Power Apps CLI. And there's an image in there, guys. If you look at that image, it's it's so pretty. Like, <laughs> there's so many cool things that we can now do with that. So I, I agree. That's going to be for and, 2021. And there's, a, there's a whole... Sorry, Scott. There, yeah. there's, a, uh, there's a whole community. Like, there is a... Ju just as with Flow, Apps, BI, um, bots, there's a whole PCF community of people that are living and breathing um, innovation and thought leadership for PCF controls. And this isn't like, the, the image that you see, that is like a soup to nuts, you know, a bunch of really cool razzle dazzle. It, it looks like it's very, very functional and meaningful, and and there are a lot of things going on there. But I mean, this you know, we've talked about scalability n number of times here. This can be a, a control for a field, yeah. you know, a single attribute. This can be a control for uh, just a simple little form control that embeds something else, like you did with a with a a bot, Scott. So you know, it can go from low, very low, very particular, discrete use cases like that, all the way to you know, like what we see here, where bunch of data very sleek design um it's visualization just, it's so cool. hierarchies flows so yeah just lots and lots of fun thanks dave appreciate that uh i think we're at time guys i don't know adam did you have your geeky deliciousness i know that's one i of the did themes. yeah actually uh, what this you was got outside outside of my santa hat and i wasn't shaking my head at you so hard <laughs> earlier uh her but this was just because i wanted to get the little fuzzy going but um this is in honor of the season uh, this, the geeky deliciousness for today's confab is brought to you by the Mandalorian. We're not sponsored. That would be how cool would that be? If that, that would be amazing. Mandalorian, um, please, please sponsor we'll us. Get there one I day. can't see anything, but, just so you know. Uh, this is the. Um, <laughs> it is. It's another Funko. When I when I there, I kind of see him in the bottom there. Oh come on! <laughs> this is the worst. <laughs> it's because I'm, face, I'm in low facial light. recognition. Here, there here. you go. Look at that. Oh, with was... with with the child. That's awesome. So it's uh it's Mandalorian with the child, and tomorrow's the season finale. So is it the finale already? Of season two. Ah, uh, dang it! Now we gotta wait a whole year <laughs> or whatever <laughs> or... afterwards. Yeah. Yep. <sighs> All right. Well, guys, thank you again for joining us on Confab. Next session that we do. Um, on, I think, is it January 14th that we're See you at? next year. Yeah, exactly. Make sure, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, <laughs> enjoy your time, obviously, with family uh, and friends, hopefully. 
Uh, on Thursday, January 14th, we're going to pick this back up and we're going to do the opposite of this type of discussion. We're going to start predicting 2021. We're going to talk about some of the key trends like we were talking about today uh, and building on that. I think it's going to be a lot of fun because we're going to, you know, guys, bring bring some of the crazy concepts that you guys have. Like we want to hear it in chat. It's great to have you guys on here to be able to talk with you and see what you guys are thinking. Um, but like I said, on the 14th, we're going to be covering those predictions on the 28th. We're going to be doing an ask the experts. So tell people um, if you're on chat right now, tell people about that session, free consulting time. Uh, if you have questions about some of the capabilities uh, of your solution or of the Dynamics platform, we'd love to answer them and go into some more who detail are, with it. Yep. Who are we bringing in for that one? Uh, that's you, Marcus. You're you're running that one entirely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's our guest caller. From yeah, before, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was, I was going to say it's kind of like uh, Hey Google, right, type of thing, where all right. of a sudden <laughs> it starts ringing and, and David's like, yeah, I thought it was calling me as well, so... Um, and then, you know, beyond that, then on February 11th, we're going to have the live agents. Also note, guys, on the 14th, we more than likely, that's the goal. We're trying to get to it. We'll be live on uh, LinkedIn as well. So we, you may see, yeah, fingers crossed, you guys may see a broadcast that goes out at some point here uh, as we test it. Um, it'll be late at night. It'll be us three. It'll be uh stone ridge uh late night too or, many, or, or not, not too yeah many yeah or yeah it'll be more uh, fun than anything but we're we're gonna try that we're gonna test it and just see how it goes but just know that that is coming and hopefully like i said on january 14th we will be we will be live so with that gentlemen thank you great year a hey, lot of fun this is this is for you too this is for you guys on the stream <laughs> great year we will it talk awesome we will talk to you on the 14th like i said Stay safe, stay happy, and uh, enjoy your family and your, your holiday events. See you guys. Thanks. See you all.